go ahead and get started. I'm assuming everybody can hear and see me okay. Okay, perfect. So let me start sharing my screen. Okay, everyone can see my screen okay? Okay, perfect. So we are gonna cover a couple things today. Here are the objectives of our session. First one being identify possible content delivery scenarios. I know that a lot of you have been teaching online because of obvious reasons, but I just wanted to kind of distinguish between the two different types. I also want to talk about the different pros and cons to various home setups, as well as discover the best possible setup for your personal space. And we're gonna have a little activity where I'm gonna have you guys kind of switch up where you usually sit to see what other options and you have in your house that might be better than what you're currently using. And then also explore possible tools and softwares that are available for different lecture capture opportunities that you guys might not be aware of. So first, I wanted to talk about synchronous versus asynchronous. And so these are the two main content delivery scenarios. Synchronous being when you have a designated time and place to meet, kind of like what we're doing right now. So you knew on Monday to sign onto my Zoom link at three o'clock. And so that way you're gonna see me and be able to interact with me. And I'm recording this session for those that might not be able to attend or for you to view at a later time. So this is just a way that I am delivering content for you. And then you have the asynchronous, which is where it's more flexible and you don't have a designated time and place. I'm going to pre-record information that will be distributed to you and you can view it at your own convenience. And so those are the two different delivery types. Now some of the tips I'm going to show you might pertain to asynchronous and some might pertain to synchronous and sometimes it's going to pertain to both. But I wanted to make sure we all had the same kind of vernacular so that way when I reference synchronous and asynchronous you know what I'm referencing. So I see we have some more people that have joined us. Hello. So out of curiosity, and just kind of hold up your hand, how many of you guys have taught online before prior to the pandemic? Because I know now all of us have experience with it. And how many of you guys have created instructional videos of your own? OK, well, this is good. <laughs> OK, perfect. So I'm going to talk firstly about how to make yourself look best on camera. And so I'm going to give you some tips and tricks. And as we talk through them, some of them might pertain to your setup and some of them might not. But this is hopefully just to kind of get you guys thinking about different options and things that you can do to make yourself look, quote, best on camera. So you're going to see some unattractive photos of me throughout this presentation <laughs> because I hate taking screenshots of myself. So the very first thing of how to make yourself look best on camera is I'm currently in a space that I have a huge window and I'm very lucky to have beautiful sun and everything like that. But when I first went in my office, I wanted to put my desk so that way I kind of had the sun behind me. And then you can see on the right hand side that depending upon how big your window is in placement, a lot of cameras can auto expose themselves to make the background outside look nice and bright, but it causes you to look dark, which we don't want to do because obviously they can't see anything about your face. And so when you position yourself to either be in front of the window, meaning facing the windows facing you, and I'll have a picture to show you, or on the side, it will light you so much more evenly. And so it can really make some of like the dark shadows and flaws go away. And so when you have a window that is in your space, instead of positioning yourself to be with your back, so your camera and your webcam is facing the window, try to put the window on the side of you or in front of you, like you see in the pictures here. Now I will say this room that I have in here, I have a very, very bright window and I'm going to open my blinds so everybody shield your face. Um, so when I open them, even though the window's on the side of me, because I'm so close to the window, it can get very blinding and you can see how it's kind of auto exposing again and how uh, you are sign and seeing how bright this is, but you can't see the features of my face. So that's why I have these blackout curtains here to help hide that. But again, if I move my camera and bear with me, 
I'm going to move my can you guys see the difference that that made such a big difference and then if I'm in front again it's going to make me a lot darker so give me one second I'm going to set up my my setup again because I had to move this and one thing that I do because with big windows in my office it can get a little toasty in here because there's not a lot of air circulation. So I closed my blinds and I added a lamp right here. And you can see when I turn my lamp off, how dark my features can get. But when I just put on a simple light, how now you can see my facial structure and kind of my mannerisms and things a little better than what it was without the light. Do you guys see that difference there? Okay, perfect. Let me plug this back in and I'll go back to sharing my screen. Give me one second. Stand by. Here we go. Okay. Can everybody see my screen again? Okay, perfect. I'm going to go a lot of back and forth between sharing and unsharing my screen so you guys can see kind of what I'm referring to. So if you get dizzy, I'm sorry. I'm going to try to do my best to not do that as much. Ashley, there was a question about the lamp, if it was special. Okay, let me pull up the question. What kind of light? It was not special. I actually grabbed this light from my daughter's um, bedroom. It usually has a lamp shade on top of it but a lamp shade can cause it to kind of get dimmer and not as much light is gonna go through. And because my office is a little darker by just my overhead lighting, I took the lamp shade off. And so that way it kind of illuminates more in the room. But yeah, you do not need any sort of special lighting. And one thing I forgot to mention is everything I'm gonna talk through today is I'm gonna to try to teach you guys a lot of tricks that you have that are going to be stuff that you have in your house already that you might not need to buy any additional equipment. Now I'm still going to talk through some recommended equipment if let's say you don't have a light or you're in a noisy environment, some tools that you can use to make it a little better. But everything I'm going to talk through is should just be stuff that I hope that you have in your house already. But good question. Sorry I didn't mention that earlier. So I see that we have some people that are wearing glasses. And this is something, I have blue light glasses that I'm sure some of you guys have seen me wear. And my typical setup, and I'm gonna turn my light off. And I'm gonna stop sharing my screen so you guys can see me a little better. So when I put my glasses on, do you guys see all the reflections that I have in my glasses? Which is pretty typical when it comes to glasses. And it can happen for two reasons. One reason being that the room isn't properly lit and isn't well lit. So you can see when I turn my lamp on, a lot of those glares go away, but not all of them. Now, if you take your glasses and tilt them downward, so instead of wearing them like this, you tilt them with the glasses down with the kind of the, what are these called, earpieces up, it can remove a ton of that glare. And that's a trick that I do all the time with a lot of people that I film that are wearing glasses. And it might feel a little awkward on your head at first, but when you look at the viewer, you can't tell that I tilted my glasses downward at all. And it just takes some getting used to, but it makes the biggest difference in the world. So make sure you're lit properly and tilt those glasses slightly down. And that can help tremendously and cause less distracting. Because sometimes it's even distracting to myself because I'm somebody that sometimes I hide myself view on Zoom, but for today's like today, I want to see what I look like to make sure I'm showing you things. But even when I'm talking here, I see all these things happening on my glasses and it's very distracting to not only me, but to you guys too. And one giveaway is if you are in a meeting, you're wearing your glasses. If I'm looking at stuff on my computer, you can see that happening in your glasses. So if you want to get away with Facebooking during meetings, point those glasses down. <laughs> okay. I'm not sure that would work for trifocals. You know, I, 
That is a good point. I do not wear trifocals to be able to know how that would work, but you can always try to do the evenly light yourself and that can help with the glare some, but it might not get rid of it all the way. Um, but yeah, that is a good point. I have not thought about trifocals and my apologies for not thinking of that sooner, but thank you for referencing that. Any other questions that you guys may have? Feeling good? Okay. I'm going to go ahead and share my screen again. Okay, so this is a question that I get a lot of the time. Does my background actually matter? And the answer is yes. One of the reasons being that your background says a lot about who you are professionally. And so when, it, let's say I am giving you a lecture about the importance of instructional design and all of that fun stuff, something very important. But I'm sitting with my children's ball pit behind me, all these different kitchens and toys right here. And that kind of immediately is like, wait a second, that's kind of weird and odd <laughs> that you're talking professionally, but you have all these kids toys behind you. So it's something that you need to think about of how you want to present yourself. And we wanna make sure you come off professionally. And one other thing is not only is it kind of how you come off, but it also can be distracting to viewers. One thing, a clock right here, some people, let's say that you pre-recorded it, some people could be looking to say, my instructor recorded this at you know, 11 o'clock at night. What is she doing up at 11 o'clock at night? Or you can see where it got cut because the clock did say 10 o'clock and then it cut us something out and now it says five o'clock. And so people can see things like that and they're like, this is weird and odd. But also it can be distracting to just kind of look at some of these toys behind me. And I know one meeting, Jenny was mentioning that this plant I have behind me, she found because of my distracting, because she was like, is it real? Is it fake? What is that thing? And I have a piece of artwork over here too that some people ask too. So certain things in your background that you might not find distracting, other people might be like, wait a second. And I even have a photo over here too that people could be glancing at. So kind of those things, think through what your background is saying about you and how it could be distracting to a viewer. And I know a lot of us don't have, right now, it's an interesting situation because we don't really have a lot of options, but we can try to make things work. And one thing that I did in this picture is I just turned myself and I tried to put myself as closely up against a wall as I could. And so that way I was like, there might not be as many distractions because I have a picture and a door and nobody can see what's behind the door, even if I have a messy bedroom or anything like that. But it can really help make sure that you come off professional as well as not provide as many distracting options for viewers. So if you don't have the option to have a tidy and neat area, Zoom gives you the ability to use a virtual background. And so that can help tremendously if you are like, I have nothing available to me. And so I'm gonna stop sharing here. And if you go, oh, Jenny's in a bed of flowers. <laughs> and so if you go down to your Zoom controls, and if you haven't done this yet, it should be on the bottom left. It should be next to a microphone and a video camera. And next to the video camera, you should have like a little carrot pointing up, a little carrot. And you should have an option to choose a virtual background. And from there, you can choose an automated one or you can choose and upload your own. And so it looks like <laughs> some people, so Natasha and Molly, depending on what you have in your background and your lighting, it can cause it to look a little funky, as you can see here. So it's some things that you'll have to play with to figure out what's a good background to use and what lighting do I need? Because with the virtual background, it's essentially doing something that's keying you out. And so if you're not evenly lit, Natasha's running. She's <laughs> If you're not evenly lit, it can cause some of those weird issues. And so especially with a lot of movement, you can see when I move, sometimes the camera can have a hard time keeping up, but it's a lot better than potentially having some kind of messy and unprofessional things in the background here. So just something, a quick tip for you to think about. So I'm gonna turn my background off. And again, if you wanna turn it off, you just go back to that little carrot pointing up and then click none under your virtual background. Okay, let me screen share. And I do apologize if you can hear, they're paving the road right outside. 
it's been a process for like a month that I feel like every day they do something with our road. So if you hear it, I apologize. <laughs> so what's the best camera angle? So how many of you guys have been on a call where either you see somebody's just their forehead or it's down really low or things like that? So that makes a difference. So here, oh, I have a typo on my slide. I have fixed this typo like 10 times, hang on. Sorry guys, let me fix this because it's gonna drive me nuts. So by default, a lot of cameras are going to be positioned not the most attractive way because of how low that they're gonna be on your desk. And so this is me having kind of just a little lap tray that I put my laptop on. And you can see how unflattering it is in my chin area because it is darker and it also kind of looks like a double chin that's coming off. But if you move your web camera and you, ang and you physically lift it up, it can make you look so much better and it gets rid of some of that dark glare and the possible double chin look. Now, when I say lift it up, I'm gonna show you what I use, but not everybody is going to have access to it. So I'm going to stop sharing my screen and try to lift this out so you guys can see what I use. Oops. So this is just what it would look like with just on my desk. And I use something that's called a roost stand that my camp, my laptop physically goes into. And I know that a lot of you probably don't have a roost stand, but what it does, you can stack books on top of one another and try to get your camera at eye level. And that can help tremendously depending upon how the angle of your camera is. Does that make sense? Okay. I'm going to move this up and I apologize. I'm going to mute my mic because I'm sure it's very loud for you guys when I'm moving around. While Ashley's doing that, I'll say Amazon boxes also do an incredible job. So my laptop is sitting on an Amazon box and I just plug a, a keyboard and mouse into my laptop at home. I didn't want to bring home like my desktop setup, And so my camera is literally like probably at, like forehead level actually right now. I can't do anything about the blinding sun. However, I need to move. <laughs> okay, so I am gonna start sharing my screen again. And we talked about the tall and low, but we also have how to point the camera. So always try to work on pointing it downward because so many times people will point it upward. And you can see most of my ceiling and my eyes. You want to be able to see my full face. Nobody cares about the ceiling and everybody wants to be able to see your mouth and your facial expressions, especially if you're recording an instructional video. It can be very distracting if you are recording yourself and even in a Zoom session like we are right now. If I was talking to you this entire time like this, I'm sure it looks a little weird and funky. <laughs> and so you don't, it kind of, you want to make it look as if you were in person with me. You want to be able to see my entire, my entire body essentially, because you can see my gestures and my mannerisms and things like that. So very important and things to think about. And Zoom is a great resource that you can see yourself. So if you want to take a peek at what you look like before you go into a meeting, you always have the ability, if you go back to that carrot option and you go to video settings, it shows you what you'll look like. If you're somebody that likes to hide self view or they only look in active speaker view, you can quickly make sure that you are positioned on camera appropriately. Okay, so additional pro tips. I know this sounds super simple, but sit up straight. I, I will tell you, I have the worst posture so much that my sister's birthday gift to me was a posture corrector thing that buzzes at me when I slouch. And coming and sitting on a computer screen all day, I tend to slouch so bad. And then even I scoot to the very end of my seat. And if you've ever come to see me when we were up in uh, 302 in the LDC, sometimes people walk up and I would be sitting all the way like this and not even realizing it. Because when you're on your, when you're on your computer all the time, it gets uncomfortable, especially if you have a chair that's not meant to be a desk chair because a lot of us weren't used to working at home. 
So before you record, try to remember to sit up straight because it's gonna make you look the best, essentially. Nobody wants to look slouched. Make eye contact is very important. So even though we're virtual, making eye contact can help make those connections with your students and with other people as well. And even when I'm making instructional videos for students, I still look at the camera because you're addressing your students. You don't wanna be looking down and talking to you know, your desk. You don't wanna be looking to a secondary monitor because somebody like me, I have a secondary monitor and when I'm in meetings, sometimes I'm referencing this monitor, but when you're wanting to reference and talk to your students, put that content on the monitor where your webcam is so that way it looks like you're looking and addressing them directly. One thing that I know a lot of us like to wear sweatpants when we work from home. <laughs> I've had a lot of meetings where we, people are in t-shirts and sweatpants and things like that, but I always say if you're not gonna wear it to class, don't wear it to your synchronous class session and don't wear it when you're recording yourself. Because again, it's a representation of who you are professionally. Now that doesn't mean that you can't rock the sweatpants at the bottom with a beautiful blouse on top. I have been known to do that as well. But I will say one time I got caught because I had a toddler run into my room and I had to get up and remove her. And so everyone got to see my beautiful flower pants that were at the bottoms, even though I had like a dress blouse on. So if you're gonna wear the sweatpants, just be careful and be conscious <laughs> of if you have to get up or anything, because it can look a little silly when everyone now knows that I wear sweatpants. But I did not wear sweatpants today, in case anyone asked me. <laughs> I made sure that I wore jeans on the bottom. Ashley, I think you have a question from Natasha. Yes, here, let me pull up the chat. I didn't put it in chat because I didn't know how to write it. <laughs> you say, the, how do you get the UVA backgrounds? No, no, no. Here's my real question. Oh, oh okay. <laughs> my real question is when you are recording um, a video, but you have, have to look at your notes a lot, I, I never know where to put the notes in order to look like I'm looking at them. And I was wondering. That's a great you... question that I was going to reference in part two, but I'm going to tell you right now. Oh. <laughs> so one thing that you can do is make an outline and put it on post-its and put the post-its around your camera on the outside or even slightly above it and so that way when you're referencing you will look at the side or slightly above it of your mic instead of or not of your mic of your video camera instead of looking down at your nose continually so if you and of course we you're probably going to have an outline instead of like detailed notes that we don't want you to read off of it. So if you just have quick bullets and outlines that you want to reference, that's a great way to kind of hide it as well. And then one thing that I am doing as we speak is I have because I have two monitors. So if you have a two monitor setup, I put my notes on the computer that has the webcam. So when I'm talking to you guys, you don't know that I'm looking at my notes, but on the right side is where I'm sharing my screen. And so I can navigate through my screen here. So if you have two monitors, that's another hack that you can do. Does that help? Perfect. So another quick tip is find an area that has minimal or no background noise if you have that option. And I believe, I can't remember who we were talking to. Was it you, Julia, that we were saying that you were on a meeting that somebody had a bird that you could hear chirping during the meeting? In, um, and one thing that I say is when you are in a space for so long, you have a tendency of zoning out some of those kind of noises that you're used to hearing. But somebody that comes into a meeting that's not used to hearing a bird chirping all the time or possible kids playing in the background, it can be really distracting to them because they, they're like, what is that noise chirping? Or is that traffic that's driving by? Or in my case, a lot of the times I have two children that are usually throwing temper tantrums because they are young <laughs> and that I'm home. And so you can hear my kids crying sometimes as well. And so I try to find a space that's as far away from that situation as possible. So that way it doesn't become distracting. Now I know that again, it's easier said than done based on the household that you're in. And there is um, some microphone sets that you can purchase. And I'll talk a little bit about that. That can help minimize and noise cancel that if you're in an environment that you don't have the ability to go into a room that's quiet to be able to record or conduct your class sessions. 
And Melissa says that she is near a shooting range down the road. <laughs> And then um, another option or another tip that I wanted to say is properly secure your camera. A lot of times, a lot of web or a lot of laptops have built in webcams, which is perfect. And as long as your laptop is properly secured, you don't have to worry about it. I'm talking about if you have an external webcam that some people will put on a tripod or attach it to the top of your laptop or if you're recording on your phone. And I have had some instructors that record lecture on their phones, but they record it when they're holding the phone. And a lot of times people's hands aren't steady because you gesture or just naturally, it's really hard to extend your hand. So find something to properly secure it, whether it's a tripod or whether it's just a stack of books or something to be able to secure your camera. Very, very important. And if you are gonna shoot in a mobile device, I always say, to film landscape instead of portrait. Landscape is kind of the, uh, the longer way, like this, as opposed to portrait like this. This can help fill the screen. Portrait can help fill the screen and show more content, whereas portrait mode can start cutting off things on the screen. And so if you have that ability, portrait as opposed to landscape. And then lastly, which I'm sure is called touch up appearance and I always use it only because I have like I said small children and concealer can only do so much when you don't get a lot of sleep. So if you want to touch up your appearance what it does in zoom is it just puts a light filter over your face to kind of smooth and blend out some of your features. So if you go down to your zoom controls and you hit that little carrot right by your video icon and go to video settings you're gonna see an option that's called touch up appearance. That's a little checkbox. Does everybody see that checkbox? So if you check it on, you'll see that like a light glow goes over your face. So I'm gonna turn mine off. Don't be scared guys. <laughs> so it's turned off now. And then when I turn it on, it kind of smooths out some of my facial features. And so that is something that you can do that a lot of people don't know about, but it can, make at least for me i feel like it makes a difference it makes me feel better <laughs> about myself especially if i have to go into a meeting and i call it a no makeup day i put it on and nobody will know <laughs> okay so we are now going to have you try it out yourself so we, i'm going to give you guys about five five minutes and i'm going to have you turn off your cameras and try to find a place that's in your house that you haven't used before and try some of these tips to try to see how to make yourself look better. Now, if you're not on a laptop, this is gonna be a little harder for you and you can either join on your mobile device or you can just try kind of moving your desktop if you can and kind of just think about some of these things or position your background a different way or find a virtual background that might be better for you but just kind of start thinking about some of these things and see if you can find a spot that you might have not thought about before that's going to be a great setup for you so go ahead and turn your cameras and microphones off and then try to find a different location just to see maybe you'll like that better so I'm going to give you guys about five minutes and when you're back, go ahead and turn your cameras back on so that way I know that you're back.
Okay, it looks like everybody is back and in a different location. So I wanted to take this time. What did you guys think? Was it hard to find a spot? I saw some people, Natasha said everything is distracting or there's not air conditioning in some of the rooms. So what were some of the things that you took into account when you finding your space? And what were some of the hardships that you might not work for your space? And we can try to think of a way to make it better if you can. I have um, been engaging in this activity already, and I, I previously had my desk where the I had, I think the situation that you have, Ashley, where the, the, it, the window is on the side, but super bright. So I ended up moving everything, actually moved this desk like all the way back. So the window is over here, but now I'm finding it's too far away, like it's too far away from the window. So I, what I did just now is like, I'm sitting, using a box, <laughs> sitting on the floor <laughs> um, to get, to kind of figure out where the light is better. Like this isn't sustainable how I'm doing it right this second, but that's what my process was. And I'm wondering, should I, can I move the desk up here? Yeah, you can, if the window is in front of you as we speak, you could move your desk. Cause right now I shifted myself. So the window is right in front of me and I don't have any lights on now. I'm all being lit from the window. And to be honest, it looks better when it's getting lit naturally from the window. But because my space, I like having it angled there because you guys probably don't know, but I have a humongous treadmill in my office as well and other furniture. And I was like, I would love to be lit like this all the time, but because of the other furniture I have, I chose that setup. And so I tried to make that setup work with what I had by adding the light in the room, darkening curtains and kind of trying to make my background less distracting, but apparently the plant is very distracting. <laughs> so I'll have to move the plant. Um, but those are some things to work with that you can try to move your desk closer to the window if you wanted to, or even if you wanted to angle, you could always have your desk kind of point, a blank wall can work perfectly. If you have just a blank wall somewhere that you could just kind of position yourself between, yep, right there. <laughs> and is that is that what you usually do, Melissa? Is that blank wall behind you? Yes, it is. It just, it seems like it's, I'm too far from the window and it almost looks too blah. Like I've been like looking, I'm like, that is so boring. <laughs> you could always play with the virtual backgrounds too, or you can add some greenery, some plants <laughs> behind you or a piece and of just artwork. Just warn Jenny if I'm on a call with her. It's not like a tiny little plant where you're like, what is that? You know, like a big fern. <laughs> Anybody else that wants to share your setups? So I have a desktop with a built-in camera. And so I really don't have very many options about moving it around. Um, and I'm in this room because the last room that I was in had way too many distractions, but now there's absolutely nothing. And the, um, the lighting is really hard because I've got a window next to me uh, which, so I tend to have just half of my half of my faces in the shadows. I turned a light on to try to compensate for that, but it, it, then it's glaring in my face while I'm trying to work, and that's just not sustainable. So I've angled it upwards a little bit. It might be a little bit better, but it's a little dark. Mm -hmm. um, I just am really, I've been struggling with this since, uh, let's see, the second week of March. So what light did you turn on? Is it a lamp or is it an overhead light? It's a lamp. It's, it's a stand lamp. The light is up very high. Okay. Can you try, and I don't know if you're available to do this now, but you don't have to do it right now or maybe after. Where is the light source coming from? Is it in front of you or have you tried putting it to the side of you? It is to the side of me and uh, well, it's sort of slightly in front, slightly to the side. It's right there. So what happens, maybe try putting the light behind you somewhat or putting the light on the opposite side of the room so it still lights the room, but it's not as clearing in your face. And I'm not sure how big your room is, but even if you put it at an angle and it's like kind of further away, that might be able to help. 
or try a different light. Like if you have a lamp that you could pull from a different room and that's what I did, I just grabbed, I grabbed a random lamp that my daughter uses. And even though it's kind of annoying to plug it back and forth every day, it makes a difference, at least for me. And so you could always try a different light fixture if that one is really distracting and very hard on your eyes, because it is gonna be difficult because you do have glasses. And even though the downward facing is gonna help somewhat, you still are gonna to want to properly light yourself as well. So I don't know how yeah. helpful that is. I've tried all the lamps I have in my house and moved them all around. It, 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 this, this is the best I've been able to find. Do you, and this is the only room that you can be in? Or is there another room that you can? Yep, this desktop sits inside of an armoire. It, there's just not very, there's only two mm -hmm. places in the house it can go. And the other one is very busy. Well, and it actually was worse because the light, the window was bigger. <laughs> <laughs> I have to say, I've been, I've been in a bunch of meetings with U of A, and I think this is actually the best lit, though I have seen you in all the meetings. But I, th I mean, I think it's, I mean, you, you really had, you had like, um, what's that Batman character where like half of your face was, like, I can see your whole face today. I know it doesn't feel like enough, but like the changes you've made have really helped. Okay. It's, it's definitely is helpful. Why don't, I'll think of maybe one day we can set up a time to Zoom and you can just give me a tour of that room and then I can try to see and we can kind of play with some things. And it could be that maybe instead of one lamp, maybe we try two lamps in case it's dark on only one side, we can try to light your room with more lamps too, unless it's the brightness issue. And then maybe we have to try to see if there's somehow that we can put a shade on that light or something that we can kind of prop over it to help dim it some and not be as hard on your eyes. Because having a light right at your face Thank you. can be not fun. Anybody else that wants to? share what they did or things that they now are taking into account. I think everyone's setup looks nice. You all improved. I'm like really proud of all of you. I know that matters a little, but I'm impressed. <laughs> <laughs> but no, I think you guys all look really great. And I know Natasha, you said that everything is distracting in your house, but I think that setup is fine. You have a nice picture behind you and you have a blank wall and I think you're, I think it's fine. And also something to take into account, everybody is going to be in a situation where you might not have a beautiful studio set up. So we're working with what we have and it might not be perfect, but we've improved just based on a couple little recommendations that I told you about, you know, 20 minutes ago. So think about when you actually have more time besides like five minutes to kind of think through and try to position your camera or maneuver and things like that. And it could be that maybe you have a different setup that you found that you didn't think about before. When you're just sitting there one day eating dinner, you're like, this spot is going to be the best spot for me. <laughs> okay, so let me go ahead and share my screen again. Da -da -da -da. So I have some other important things to consider. Oops. So this is a very large slide and I wanted to get through everything, but it's all important information. So this is something Natasha asked me before, and something I recommend is think before you record or lecture. And what I mean by that is to have an outline or an agenda of what you're gonna be talking about. So you can quickly reference them instead of looking down at your notes as much as possible and taking your eyes off the camera. You can post post-its or around your computer screen or slightly above it so it still looks like you're talking directly to people. You can also, do agendas, especially for synchronous class sessions. So that way you don't run into as many technical glitches. So let's say that you decided you wanted to do breakout rooms at this particular part. You know exactly when it's going to happen. You know that you can set it up prior to your, you know, the class session and the time that you need it for. And that way it can help prevent some technical glitches instead of you waiting there and kind of fiddling with some of the breakout rooms or annotation features and things like that. It kind of puts your mind in that mindset of certain technology that you need to reference. And you can even start pre-populating some of that content as well. Also, when you're doing pre-recorded lectures, 
it can help you save on time. So many times I have instructors that like to come in and record right off the cuff. And we find that it's a lot harder because even though you know the content, it's harder for you to think and pull that information right off the cuff. Whereas if you had an outline, you know exactly what points you wanted to hit and you make sure you hit all those points instead of you wanting to go back and re-record because you forgot something really important. So it's something that can help save you time if you just take the couple minutes or an hour or so to come up with an outline. And one benefit about doing an outline in a synchronous class session is that you can even send that to your students prior to class so they know what to expect. Or let's say you recorded the session and a student got kicked out of the session and they came back in, you know, 15, 20 minutes later because they were in any internet issues. They can go back to that recording and follow along on the agenda and find out what part that they missed so they can navigate to that part of the recording easier and faster. So something that's really important and I think would save you guys a lot of time. Another tip is to keep your lecture short. And I know I always say six to seven minutes is ideal. And I get so many instructors that are like, I can't possibly lecture in that amount of time. But the reason why six to 12 minutes is ideal for recorded lectures is because once six minute happens and there's studies that I have linked in the PowerPoint um, that say that after six minutes, people's attention spans kind of start to dip off. And so they start to not be as engaged in the content. And there's also cognitive overload as well. So if you're gonna be lecturing for a straight 45 to an hour on a video, students aren't gonna be able to retain that much information and they're also going to zone out essentially. And they're not gonna be able to have all that information to be absorbed. So if you can get six to seven minutes, that's ideal. 12 minutes is kind of the max that Studies have proven that students can kind of still retain information after 12 at the 12 minute mark, but you lose a lot of your viewers at that way. And so I always tell instructors that I say six to 12, but if you can't meet all your objectives in that time frame, it doesn't mean that you can't chunk your content and make multiple videos about certain topics. Or if you wanted to break it up into very topical videos, you could have three videos that they watch that are five minutes a piece. I think you're gonna have a way better attention span for your students than if you recorded you know, a 30 to 45 minute lecture. And that is when I talk about asynchronous. Now, when I talk about synchronous class sessions, I also don't want you guys sitting there and lecturing for 45 minutes. Something that I like to implement is a 10 and two rule for synchronous sessions. And essentially that you lecture or give information for 10 minutes or so, and then you pause for a couple minutes to either let them discuss the information or reflect on the information given to them. So you could pose a question, you could have them do a simple activity like we did where they just kind of think about all the information that was given to them and now they're going to implement it in a certain way and just gives them a way to give their brains a break and then you can come back and lecture some more. So it gives them time to reflect and actually absorb that information instead of you just kind of lecturing for 45 minutes at a time. Something really important to note is closed captioning any sort of videos that you want your students to have access to because we have students that might have some sort of hearing impairment that isn't going to be able to present the content to them or it could be somebody whose English is their second language and they might not be able to process it as fast as you speak it. Sometimes having captions can help or if you have a student that is a parent and let's say they have a baby that's sleeping, you can still, they can still watch the lectures and read it instead of having that audio go. And I am somebody who I was in school while I had my daughter. And so I would do that sometimes um, while I was nursing, I would, or she was sleeping and she would be able to kind of sleep and kind of hang out while I was able to still process and see that information because of those captions. So something to think about. Canvas Studio is a I hope you guys know what Canvas Studio is, <laughs> but if you don't, um, it is a way that you can record your screen captures or your lectures and then post it into Canvas, but there is an auto captioning option that you can utilize and it's going to caption it to with, I believe it's up to 95, 85. 
it's 85 or 95, I can't remember the statistics, I apologize, with accuracy. And then you have the ability to edit those captions if you want to. And so I have used them quite extensively with a lot of my videos and I find them to be really accurate. The only time that I see that it continuously messes up is my last name. And so if it's a certain last name like Caudill that they're like, I'm not quite sure what that is, then it's probably gonna mess it up. But if your last name is Falls, it's probably gonna pick that up better. Um, but it's a really great tool and it's only literally a couple clicks and then you can caption your videos. With Zoom, you have the ability to request audio, request audio transcriptions for any meeting that you have. It's under your record settings and it's a checkbox. So after this meeting, what I'm gonna get, and I will show you really quickly on my screen what it looks like. Can you guys see that? So this is what my transcriptions looks like after I lecture or do some sort of presentation or something. It tells exactly who spoke at what time and what they said. And so you'll get that at the end of every Zoom, essentially lecture or presentation that you could then post to your students that they can then watch or kind of follow along if they need to. I see I have a couple things, 85% accuracy. Thank you, Jenny. <laughs> I eat peas, that's funny. <laughs> okay, let me get back to sharing my screen. There's another question, Ashley, that we'll save for the end, but I just want to give you a heads up since we're getting near time. Okay, cool. And then there are do not disturb options when you are recording your lecture or if you're sharing your screen, there is on a Mac, there is a do not disturb function that you can turn on and on a PC, I'm not a PC person, but Jenny told me it's focus assist, but you can turn those on and it's gonna kind of hide some of those emails that are coming in or if you guys have text messages that come in through your phone or any alerts, it will hide all of those alerts. So it can, you don't have to re-record some of that information. So very quickly, I wanted to reference some of the equipment and software that you can use. And I wanted to let you guys know that a lot of the stuff that I talked about, a lot of you guys can just utilize what you have at home. I don't have any sort of special equipment that I use to record my lectures and it comes out just fine. But I know some of you guys, I know LeVe has some lighting issues and then I know that some people might have the in noisy environments. So we have options that we recommend and so I'm gonna start off by talking about different software recommendations. The first free ones that I'm gonna recommend are Canvas Studio, which I talked about, and that's all built into Canvas. But I know a lot of people that use Zoom if they're not familiar with Canvas Studio. So even Zoom, you can do synchronous, and you can even do asynchronous recessions in Zoom by just sharing your screen and recording it in a Zoom room when you're just by yourself and then get that link to the cloud and you can either upload that into Canvas Studio or you can just share that link with your students. Screencast-O-Matic is another option that I know a lot of instructors like using because it gives you some editing features to trim and kind of insert certain things in there and it's free with limitations. You can see that there's a 15 minute limit and it's a small watermark on your video, but you can also advance up to pro. It's either $1.65 a month or $4 a month, depending on what editing features that you want. But there's other solutions out there that aren't free that are more robust like Camtasia, or if you wanted to do like Premiere Pro or something like that, those are very costly and you're probably gonna need a additional support, so I don't recommend those tools, but I wanted to let you know that there are tools out there, depending upon how fancy and how intense that you wanted to get with the software. And then lastly, we have equipment recommendations. This is coming from ETO. Um, I put their contact information, it's hyperlinked if you want to either rent out equipment or reserve or request equipment. Here are the equipment that they have recommended if you wanted to look into it. The black wire one is costly, but that is for noise canceling if you have to record in a noisy environment where you have a bird or heavy traffic or a shooting range that's really loud and distracting. They have um, headsets that can reduce some of that noise. And so here are just some of the other options, but again, I don't think that necessarily you guys need to purchase any of these things, but if you guys feel 
that what you currently are working with isn't working for your needs, feel free to contact ETO and they would be happy to assist and give you recommendations. Just one clarification on the super fancy headset. ETO will acquire it for you. They do expect your department to actually pay for it. So they have the less expensive headset and they have some of the less expensive web cameras, but they're happy to facilitate a purchase if you want to make the case that you really need it for your experience. Uh, so there was another question in chat, Ashley, I think from Julia. Okay, Julia, what is the, I have a question for you. I need to demonstrate activities during lectures, cognitive test administration, which you'll have to explain to me what that looks like. And I'm interested in suggestions for that. Can you walk me through kind of what that is? Yes, so I teach the cognitive assessment class in the clinical and school psychology program. And so for that, I would be sitting at a table and I'd have to be administering hands-on measures and some spoken measures to a person sitting across the table from me. So I would probably have a family member serve as a guinea pig for this, um, but I'd need to have a camera angle that would be catching a scene like that um, to, to demonstrate. And then the closed caption is great that I could also be adding some pointers along the way. And I would be able to get some commercial videos available for this, but some of them I'd have to make myself. And just, you know, your suggestions on if it's not me like this in the screen, but more a scene of two people interacting with a table between them. So is it going to be asynchronous or synchronous or both? I am very much hoping for synchronous because students have lots of questions about this along the way. So you can do one of two things. One being that you could just have a secondary, if you have like a laptop or a mobile device that you can also connect in Zoom. And that way you can just then turn your camera off and then show kind of the angle of both of you guys kind of having that. And I know it's gonna be harder because I, does it, could you prop up a camera and show it or do you need a close up view of what is happening? We have ordered some really cool desktop tripods in the clinic that we could send to clients because we're also trying to figure out how to test real people <laughs> via Zoom. Um, and there are some good tripod options that help hold a phone at a good height Perfect. and angle. So I would recommend to either do the kind of the two setup or if you go into screen share, and I don't know if you have the ability because you're not a host in this meeting, and I don't know if you'll have it, but screen share has like a little carrot, and there's an advanced sharing, I think it was, hang on. I've done a lot of screen sharing of materials testing people this summer, so I have preliminary familiarity, but I... So there's an advanced share setting that you can do content from a second camera, and so if you wanted to, when it's time for you to do that kind of close up, you could always share content from that second camera. And then that way it kind of gives them that close up and then you can stop sharing and go back to your regular camera. You could also, if you wanted to, you could also, it might be easier, even though I know you wanted to do synchronous, it could be easier to record an asynchronous video. So that way you can kind of cut and I can work with you to do that. And then students can ask questions about it during your synchronous class session. Because then if we do it asynchronously, we can do some of those call outs, we could do arrows, we can practice like zooming in and things like that, which it might be more engaging and easier to capture in an asynchronous environment versus synchronous. Thanks, that's really helpful. I'm realizing I could go into the clinic on the weekend and use our camera system. Mm -hmm. That's a plug for me, for all of you, to say asynchronous has a place. I know it's not ideal, and I don't, I don't want to take away, you definitely want to have preset recurring time with your students, but as many opportunities as we can find ways to give them some content to absorb, kind of like what Ashley's saying, uh, some segments and things to watch that they can then watch before class and come to class to discuss and ask questions, and doesn't preclude you from pulling up that content during class, but if they get to interact richly with it before class, I think that's where you're going to have a lot of success this fall, then trying to do it all synchronously and show everything at once and trying to be live all the time. I think you'll burn out. I think the students will burn out as well. 
And one benefit of recording it is that students can watch it over and over and over again, as opposed to if it's in a synchronous session and if you forget to record that specific session, they're gonna miss out on that. And they might be like, oh, I remember she referenced it, but I can't remember exactly what you were talking about. Natasha, do you have a question? Yeah, oh, I wasn't muted, whoops. Um, <laughs> yes, how, so that's what I'm doing. I'm, I started my class today and I'm just wondering how long should the synchronous time be if you're trying to do a combination is there like a good length of time for the synchronous i do so today is crazy but natasha just froze for me um, okay i heard how how long is your question how long a synchronous session should be yeah yeah so what, and Jenny, I don't know if you want to take it since you are the flow model person, <laughs> but from what we have been proposing is kind of 50% of asynchronous with synchronous learning. So how long is your synchronous, how long was your synchronous session today? It, it was 9.30 to 11, which is half of a three hour class, but it felt too long. It, it was too long. Did you have any engaging activities built in as, or? I had, I had a breakout room, um discussion and a padlet but it was yeah it was yeah i i'm a fan of an hour and a half personally but jenny i don't know if you feel any differently but for me i have a tendency of liking an hour and a half okay. I don't, yeah i don't go over i try not to go over 75 minutes so hour 15 so curry technically and i feel really bad embarrassed that i'm like so brightly lit <laughs> There's no curtain in this room, and I'm like blinded by the sun. Um, the reason why I, it's the same thing a lot of what Ashley was talking about in terms of just the like Zoom fatigue, right? Yeah. On task, and so unless you're really segmenting what you're doing and kind of <laughs> moving, and possibly even, and it sounds crazy because you're like on Zoom and people are sitting, but physically moving them, right? Like hands up, thumbs up, but you know what I mean? Like getting them to like move their bodies a little bit. Um, we've all been in, the, you know, this was an hour, which probably felt just right, right? And so you start to go creep over that. And now you've been sitting for a really long time and you're watching yourself sit. It's just a very different environment. It's very, it's exhausting. So I'm a big proponent of 75 minutes and Curry's classes are actually usually two and a half hours. Well, this is a summer school class, so it's a little- Right, so it's more- yeah, yeah, I get it. But, uh, but I agree. And I also have a meeting with Ashley later so I can, I can pick her brain on everything. <laughs> Fair. And I know that's scary. I know it's, it, it feels easier sometimes to plan on synchronous. And there, there is a population of students at UVA in particular that love lecture. I'm not, you're not going to necessarily disappoint, you might not be reaching them, they might not be absorbing at all, but they, there's a part of them that really loves to hear from you, and they want, they do want that, I don't want to negate that, but delivering it in a variety of ways, when you can't be with them in person, just helps kind of take that edge off, and, and like Ashley's saying, as they interact with small bites of content, and even just have to then move from that task to something else, whether it's stop, and then I have to go to the next video, or stop, and do a reflection or stop and go to a group. Anything like that where you're kind of helping them give them those break those brain breaks, right? To do take on the next task or now apply the information. That's what's gonna help negate the fatigue of being online all the time. So I know we are over time. So I wanted to thank you guys so much for attending. I hope you guys learned something and took away some good information. Um, I will send you guys the slides in case you guys didn't bookmark that. Um, send the slides to you guys after the session. Um, but if you have any additional questions or if you want to set up a one-on-one -on -one to kind of look at your space more in depthly to try to figure out what works best for you, feel free to reach out to me and send an email and we can set up a time. But thank you guys so much for attending. I'm going to stop recording and